The trial began with Davis interjecting his dollar's worth of fiction into the state's narrative. Frank Castile, in March, April, and May, was out on that property, and he was patrolling it, and he was patrolling his property. He was patrolling off his property by the gate, and he was patrolling the dirt road out to Vandergriff Road, and he was recording in his notebook his encounters. Davis posted, We'll prove to you that on July 9th, 1988, shortly before the men were killed, that Frank Castile was in a rage on his property with that shotgun, red in the face, angry, and ready to kill. Davis continued his fiction, which the prosecution had generously titled The State's Theory, and will prove to you that the men were murdered at the gate that Frank Castile used as his forward operating position. If you think about the property, this dirt road comes in, and you hit a gate. It's called the Helican Gate. That's where Frank Castile would turn some people around. Still in his opening statement, he stated, Frank Castile, a man obsessed with the blue hole, the swimming area, a man who has gone out to get this particular piece of property and who was armed and patrolling it for months. If Frank Castile did not commit the murder against Richard Mason, Earl Smock, and Kenneth Griffith, we'd know it because there would be an entry, logbook number 113, shooting in the woods. The framers of our Constitution envisioned a fair trial based on facts, but the state theory was imagination, speculation, and innuendo. Davis was motivated by the lust for power. He wanted District Attorney Bill Cox's job. After his firing, he seemed to be cut out of the glory of this high-profile case. But he was able to manipulate his way back. He charged only one dollar to Paula Griffith Kirby, Kevin Kirby, and Lee Griffith to hire him as a special prosecutor. Mr. Cox found himself trapped in a box. He had to go along with this, or Davis would have declared in his campaign, how dare Cox ignore the victim's family's wishes. Let's take a careful look at the state's theory, in which Davis crafts his words to inspire shock and to suggest intimidation and wrongful accusation. Consider the charge that Castile was patrolling his property and the trail. This self-serving fabrication was to characterize as threatening Castile's legitimate right to enter, leave, and be present on his own property. Patrolling requires a constant presence with an extreme allotment of time. Patrolling was an accusation fabricated by the prosecution to enhance their fallacy. A demanding job of developing automated production machinery kept him busy ten hours or more on some days, and nine hours was common. Castile traveled to Japan, Mexico, and many U.S. states for research, training, machine acquisition, and plant support. Add everyday home and family responsibilities, there was not enough time for him to patrol. Patrolling was only the prosecution's storyline. No testimony was presented to back up this claim. But the state was persistent in this type of suggestive rhetoric. Property visits were not a daily activity. Most trips were brief to interface with surveyors and property owners, or as he searched for building sites. Whenever possible, there would be camping with family and friends or neighbors. There was no reason to patrol. The few chance meetings with trespassers were getting the word out. It is bizarre for an attorney to twist trespassing into a legal right, yet Davis persisted in this deception. He purposely misrepresented the trail as a public road. He knowingly omitted the fact that it was Castile's right-of-way, properly surveyed from Vandergriff Road, agreed to by owners of land it passed through, and a documented condition of the purchase contract by an attachment signed by the landowners. He knowingly misstated Tennessee law in declaring trespasser intrusion to be a legal right. In doing so, he defended their legal invasive behavior, destructive actions, and trash dumping as a harmless right. This deception was highly prejudicial prosecutorial misconduct that should have cost him the right to practice law. Davis assigned the pseudo-proper names for the trail and gate to appear as if they were singularly unique features of the region. They were not and both fictitious names were self-serving creations. And by conjuring a military-style phrase, forward operating position, he deceived the jury into envisioning a secured entrance, and a one-man army guarding this entrance. Stationing oneself at the gate would have missed trespassers who came in from Boston Branch, from Hickson Springs Road, or trails surrounding the Gulf's region. It would have been inefficient to establish a sentinel point here and ignore those trespassers. That's where he would turn some people around, Davis complained. But Castile never turned anyone around. 
he simply informed them that his property was private. The concept of private property is entrenched in common law and state statute. The concept is known by most people, except for these lawyers. All these people had turned themselves around as they contemplated the prospect of arrest and legal fees. Castile was following the sound recommendations he had received from Lieutenant Brown and was being generous to give them a pass the first time before seeking police involvement. His signs indicated that the land was private, as had Patton's posters before the sale. Patton's land had long been off limits to trespassers. Castile committed no crime by declaring his property as private, in speech or in writing. Mr. Hickman had long earned his salary by doing the same for Patton's property. Many landowners post their property to warn intruders, and rightfully expect the government's legal arm to enforce the laws against any intrusion onto their private property. Mr. Walling had this expectation when dealing with the trespasser. He had grabbed his gun and said, I will call the county and we will let them decide who is wrong. Detective Parham had expressed his approval of Walling's actions. But in this trial, we have the district attorney and a district attorney wannabe who, like the godfather's crooked lawyer, were determined to twist and turn Tennessee law on its head, where right is wrong and wrong is right. The court did not allow the jury to be taken to these locations, and only allowed them to see the area through the limited view of a camera, and that view confined to the path. The state took full advantage of the jury's lack of knowledge to obscure the locations and to create misconceptions about the gate. This distortion was a hurdle that defense attorneys never corrected throughout the trial. Listening to Davis, it was apparent that either the prosecution and the detectives had absolutely no understanding of the relative positions and intercepts of the property boundaries, trail, and terrain, or they deliberately were trying to confuse the jury so their fairy tale would seem more believable. Politicians like Cox and Davis are unwilling to displease their fickle patrons, are willing to disregard unpopular laws that constituents view with disdain, and in the courtroom, a large number of the prosecution's witnesses were trespassers. Even after a professional land surveyor had confirmed the legal and recorded boundaries, the prosecution team persisted in their false descriptions. Davis gave much attention to this gate area in his opening, because only by declaration was it a murder scene. I say that because as you read further, you will see that nothing in the way of physical or scientific evidence confirms an actual crime occurred there. Davis introduced the journal logbook to the jury as if it were a crime to follow a lieutenant's recommendation to keep the names of trespassers, as if to question someone's right to exclude the public from their private property. His argument implicated every property owner in Tennessee who ever expected a right to privacy and security on their own land. You have to wonder if he extends the same privilege of access to his own drive or lawn, located in Summertown atop Signal Mountain to anyone who desires to set up camp, light a fire, throw trash on the ground, and drive recklessly over his yard. Davis capitalized on his uninterrupted dissertation to make numerous absurd claims, such as, Frank Castile decided he wanted to purchase those 130 acres, and he wanted to take possession of the Blue Hole. The Blue Hole was never Castile's reason for the purchase. But to clarify, there were three Blue Holes that were part of his land. Without these Blue Holes, he would still have been interested in buying the property. He was not obsessed with a swimming hole. If this had been the case, why would he have allowed so many trespassers to go for a swim? Don Poole gave the opening statement for the defense. So he gave them the shotgun. You can have the logbook. Where's your Jeep Scrambler? It's over at a friend's. Can we go see it? Sure. They go over. The detectives have an opportunity and a time on the 11th of July of looking at the Scrambler doing whatever they want to. There is a pistol in there. One of the detectives picks it up, smells it. He puts it back down. Don't take the pistol. Apparently not important. So Castile said, you can see the Jeep. You can see the logbook. You can see the shotgun. He gives it to them, okay? He gives it to them on July 11th, 1988, and they have had it ever since. Later, Poole shifted the focus. So what happened after 1988? Well, there's Marie Hill. And I think Frank Castile would tell you what he did during that time was wrong, but it has nothing to do whether or not a murder took place in 1988. And I submit to you, there will not be any credible proof that anything came out in 1996 that you could or would in any way consider. So what else happened between 1988 and the present time? 
I submit to you that, and I ask you up in Loudon, y'all ever been involved in a political process, and you said you had, and you may have seen some signs here, and there are a couple of men running for sheriff of Hamilton County now who have been running off and on before and again and in and out. Then Mr. Cox jumped in and cried, Objection! Politics had been played with this case for many years. Mr. Cox and Dollar Davis were running against each other. But of course, Meyer put a stop to this because he too was vying for re-election. Sneed was just planning his political advancement with the recognition that this case would bring, especially when he now could take all the credit for everything in this case. The state's first witnesses were Terry Mills and Jeff Mann. They had been trespassing on July 9, 1988, the Castile's anniversary. Lee Davis had Mills stand in front of him with Terry holding the shotgun. It was an apparent, well-rehearsed play. Davis stepped toward Mills, who swung the shotgun up like they do in the movies, and he alleged that Castile had said, Look, buddy, don't you come any closer to me. He was cross-examined by Mr. Poole. In fact, you're acquainted with Mr. Mason. He used to visit your house quite often. Well, yeah. Friend of the family? Right. Okay, you're back there. See no trespassing signs. You go through the gate, take the barbed wire down, and come back across these barriers. You're feeling as if you're not on some place that you shouldn't be? He responded. I've been there. I've been going down in there all my life. He had just admitted he had been breaking the law all his life. But it was not an issue for him because prosecutors who ignored Tennessee law in this case, had reinforced his confidence. Mr. Poole inquired, Okay, now when you went on July 11, 1988, with 48 hours or close to 48 hours after these events, you gave a statement to Lieutenant Tommy Standifer, and he was asking you specifically about Frank Castile, wasn't he? Mr. Mills mumbled, Uh-huh. Mr. Poole proceeded, You never said to him that Frank Castile pointed a gun at you? Mr. Mills did not answer the question. He tried to change the subject by saying that he had told a lot of people. On July 9, 1988, Terry Mills had a 45 Smith & Wesson in his vehicle and out of sight of Mr. Castile. It seemed to be a common thing for trespassers to carry a gun when entering private property. He was asked about the trailer he had mentioned in one of his later interviews. This assertion was false and not even logical. It would have been very difficult to pull any kind of trailer through those woods. A trailer would have been damaged crossing deep ruts, gullies, and rocks. Any sensible person seeking a more harmonious outfit would have opted for a truck with greater utility. Jeff Mann was the next witness, Mason's nephew. He told the same story about Castile pointing the gun. Poole asked, And would you say that this better describes what you would have remembered in 1988 than your given the testimony ten years later? referring to his first statement where four times he had stated he did not point the gun. But man would only say, that is a matter of opinion. Consider what some experts have said about whether early statements better reflect actual events than do later statements. Our opinions about the much-publicized trial of George Zimmerman may differ, but we all share the fundamental right to a fair trial. Alex Newman wrote an article that appeared on the website thenewamerican.com titled, Experts Weigh In After Four Witnesses in Trayvon Martin Case Change Story. The title draws attention to testimony structured with altered accounts of events. Tainted testimony is fundamentally unfair in all trials. In part, this article presents. Experts in the field, however, have noted that later recollections, which could be impacted by external factors such as publicity, for example, are thought to be less reliable than earlier memories and the addition of post-event information into the memory reconstruction process, normally unbeknownst to the person, is one reason why psychologists believe that eyewitness testimony can often be unreliable. To fill in gaps, the eyewitness relies upon his or her expectation, attitudes, prejudices, bias, and prior knowledge, explained University of North Dakota forensic psychologist Richard Wise. Furthermore, Information supplied to an eyewitness after a crime by the police, prosecutor, other eyewitnesses, media, etc., can alter an eyewitness's memory of the crime. The article takes you through the accounts that have changed in the Martin case. It continues, Memory does not function like a videotape that records everything and can be replayed at will. Innocence Project Eyewitness Identification Litigation Fellow Karen Newworth told The Herald, People remember pieces of events 
and then fill in the blanks with what makes sense. Other experts have noted that the earliest accounts are probably also the most reliable. All other things being equal, earlier recountings are more likely to be accurate than later ones. Stanford University psychology professor Barbara Tversky was quoted as saying by the Scientific American, The longer the delay, the more likely that subsequent information will get confused with the target memory. These are the matters of opinion given by experts. Jeff Mann's early statement had been truthful about the meeting with Castile, but was influenced by Perriman Sneed and by others, his friends, relatives, the media, and his own bias. Mann was questioned about saying more than once in his first interview, Castile did not point the gun, and this was how he explained what he had said. I have always been a hunter, and I've always been told when you point a gun at somebody, or when you point a gun to this right here, you bring a gun up, and you level it, and you point and shoot. And when I was asked that question, did he point the gun at Terry? In my mind, I was thinking this because, you know, no one ever specifically said he brought the gun up with both hands in his, at his waist with both hands. This answer was balderdash and undoubtedly false, because in his later statements, when asked about the gun being pointed, he had responded to the word pointed with yes at Terry. Also, just a reminder of what Detective Parham had said to Castile in his interview. In fact, the boys in their statement today made a remark that he didn't point the gun, just like you said, you had the gun down. In one of his early statements, Detective Hawkins had asked Mann, Now stop on the gun. You said when you, when Terry, started walking toward him, he kind of brought the gun up. Did he bring the gun up and level it at Terry? Repeating himself four times, Mann had responded with, He never pointed it. Hawkins' question had been clear and precise about what was being asked. To level it at Terry is the same question that Mann stated no one had asked. Also, his own testimony contradicts his ploy. He could not refrain from positioning the word point just before shoot. He was obviously aware that point is synonymous with aim. Police statements show how Mills and Mann had progressively altered their story, yet the prosecutors were allowed to deceive the jury with the developed lie. Next, David Mosteller was called as another encounter witness. In the logbook, his name was not listed. Only a note, FTL 216 tag number, Hamilton, Blue Toyota, three men. That no names were listed indicates that this had been a sighting and not an actual encounter. According to his statement, he had been with Dink Belk and Alan Barnes when they had ignored no trespassing signs on June 5, 1988. D.A. Cox asked, So y'all proceeded on from the gate area, and then how, what was the next significant event that occurred along the roadway? Mostella replied, Well, we probably went down 20 to 30 yards and were flagged down by an older gentleman that he had just come up to the truck and we had the windows down. He just walked straight up. He cocked a shotgun and laid it inside the truck, asked us what the heck we were doing there. He alleged that Castile had told them to leave or he would shoot them. But Mosteller had told the detectives back in 1990, Do you recall going through a gate? Uh-huh. Under a power line? Well, the power line was after we kind of got out to the field. You went all the way through the woods on that road, and then out to an open area? Yes. Where the power lines were? Uh-huh. He had confirmed the detective's restated description. The men would have traveled about 1,300 yards from the gate onto the clearing. The DA certainly knew what Mosteller had admitted to the detective regarding their invasion into private property, but he took advantage of Mosteller's ignorance of his own tale to let false testimony mislead the jury. On cross-examination, Mr. Lawrence asked, In fact, didn't you tell us that the distance where Mr. Castile stopped you to the power line was about the distance from where you are sitting at the end of the courtroom? Fifteen to twenty yards, maybe yes, sir, was his reply. He attempted to endorse the prosecution's planned distortion to place them close to the gate area, but even his efforts to reverse his statement still positioned them well into Castile's property and far from that gate. In his statement, Sneed had asked, He actually threatened you to shoot you if you didn't leave? Mostella replied, Yeah, I remember him saying something to that extent. His answer implied that he was not sure what had been said to him at the time. When Belk testified, he claimed his reason that this alleged confrontation was never reported to the police was that he was scared. 
If he experienced any fear at all, it would have been regarding his getting into trouble for trespassing. That is, until he and his two friends discovered that the state was fine with the criminal act of trespassing. Let's examine what Belk had said in the statement he gave in 1990 to the detectives. Sneed asked, Why did you report it after you come out of there? I just didn't. I don't know. I didn't think it was that bad of an incident. You know what I mean? I mean, we were trespassing. We were in the wrong, you know? Right, we left there and we went to another swimming hole. I just didn't think it was that big of a deal. Going back to Mosteller's statement, Sneed had asked, well, What kind of gun was it? Mosteller replied, It was a shotgun. I want to say it was a 12-gauge. I didn't, wasn't paying much attention to it. That description does not match Mosteller's and Belk's tale of a cocked shotgun being pointed and a death threat. And both claimed their names had been taken, yet only a license plate and vehicle description appear in the logbook. Furthermore, Castile did not yet own a shotgun on the date of their alleged intrusion. Randy Nunley had not yet given it to him. The state did not call Alan Barnes to the stand, and no statement had been turned over to the defense during discovery. Did the detectives talk with Mr. Barnes in 1990? If so, did he corroborate their story? Is the state hiding, exonerating evidence? Then the state put Deanne Kennedy and Michael Killingsworth on the stand. On April 8, 1985, a Chattanooga Times article written by Andy Schur declared, Three flee Silverdale, two caught hailing cab. The article explained Deanne Kennedy and another woman had been arrested the day before while trying to catch a cab a short distance from the Silverdale prison. The two women had escaped an hour earlier through a pushed-out window air conditioning unit. The newspaper also stated that Kennedy had been awaiting trial on charges of armed robbery and grand larceny. A real detective had discovered that Deanne Kennedy had later been found guilty of the armed robbery, grand larceny, and escape charge. Kennedy and Killingsworth both testified that they had been stopped near the power lines where they were trespassing. This occurred on June 11, 1988. Killingsworth said that he and Kennedy had been held at gunpoint. He claimed that Castile had racked one round into the chamber of the gun. Deanne testified, I just remember it because, you know, it's kind of shaded and dark driving through there. And then about the time you could see the clearing of the power lines and it started to brighten up, and looking up and seeing a man in front of us with a gun aimed toward the truck, and yelling, you know, to stop and stuff. He came around to the driver's side and aimed the gun at Michael and was telling him to keep his hands where he could see them and, you know, not to move and not to go anywhere, to stay right there. And then he started asking for our driver's license, and Michael was telling him he wasn't going to give him his driver's license. And he said, I'll tell you my name, but I'm not going to give you my driver's license. And then he kept saying, you kids are playing a dangerous game. Don't go anywhere. You know, keep your hands where I can see them. And at one point, I mean, I don't remember everything he said, but at one point, he told us he was trying to keep the peace and keep people away from his family. And I said to him, and the gun keeps the peace? With her armed robbery conviction, she would have known the answer. She was asked on cross-examination. Well, sounds like you guys were pretty belligerent, you know? I mean, this guy's sitting there pointing a gun at you? That's when General Bill Cox objected. That question had prompted an objection because it was revealing her provoking demeanor. They said that their group consisted of five people but not one of them ever filed a complaint regarding her allegation. Throughout the trial, some people just had to get in on the media frenzy. Sequatchie County Sheriff Joe May told a tall tale, and of course the Chattanooga Times on May 14, 1998, printed an article titled, Castile Charge No Surprise to Sheriff May. The paper required no proof of truth. May said, We had a heated discussion. I told him people been going up there since way back before our time. And if they weren't doing anything illegal, they had a right to keep on going up there. The sheriff obviously was ignorant of Tennessee law for which he had sworn to uphold, but for which he voiced contempt. The sheriff had tried to garner some attention for himself and make himself sound more significant among the community. The good old boy network had crossed county lines. The act of being there was illegal. The fact is, Castile never talked with this man. In time, his dishonesty backfired, a headline read, Sequatchie Sheriff, Clerk, Charged with Felonies. The article announced that Sequatchie County Sheriff May had been arrested by state investigators. He was charged with three counts of official misconduct. He had been releasing prisoners early 
and using inmate labor to benefit himself. Then in 2005, he was arrested for illegal hunting. The arresting officer said that when he pulled him over, May got out of the truck and stated, I used to be the Sequatchie County Sheriff, but this officer did the right thing and informed him, well, you're in Hamilton County and you're breaking the law. Obviously, honesty was not a trait May preferred. Paula Mason Griffith was now married to Kevin Kirby. The two were married on April 14, 1990. Kevin had served with Kenneth and Earl. She told how Earl and Kenneth and she had come here from Florida in 1988. The attorney she hired for a dollar asked, Sometime during this eight-and-a-half-hour drive, back from Florida, back to your parents' house on Signal Mountain, was there a conversation between you and Earl and Kenneth, talking about there was a place, a blue hole that he had gone to in this area up in Decatur, and there was also some conversation about a blue hole being on Signal Mountain? Throughout the trial, Davis continually lifted his rhetoric to the level of testimony through inappropriate leading questions. Paula replied, Yes, there was. Kenneth had been there many, many times. I'd been there twice in my teenage years, and he brought up that there was a similar place like that that he used to go to himself, usually in his four-wheel drive pickup with cousins or friends from school. And they got on to the conversation, and Kenneth said he would like to have had a four-wheeler. He'd like to go back in there sometime. She generally repeated the storyline that Davis had mapped out. She talked about her father Richard, her mother Martha, Smock, and their supper on July 9, 1988, at the Mason home. She said, They talked around the table about maybe taking a ride, depending on how soon Mother got supper done. And they discussed taking a ride since Earl was there and he had his three-wheeler. She then talked about them borrowing Stanley Nixon's three-wheeler. She stated that she had wrapped a pistol in a towel for Mason, who put it under the seat of his ATV. Paula said it was common for Mason to carry the gun with him. It should be noted, a man named Butch Ford, who worked at Muller, said someone had told him Mason kept his gun in his workplace toolbox. Paula stated, You know, many times in the summertime there were snakes. You know, it was more or less for protection. Then Davis attempted to mitigate Paula's testimony. He contributed improper bias with unsolicited testimony. Okay, not necessarily for people. Later, when Castile was asked by District Attorney Bill Cox, why did you carry a gun sometimes and not carry it other times? Castile replied, sometimes it was for snakes, that sort of thing. Both answers were the same, but Castile's answer was characterized as the most illogical answer that could be given. Paula continued, we became concerned, but mother, knowing daddy always came back home, she was concerned that maybe they ran out of gas. You know, she kept saying, they can't be lost, there was a full moon out. This was a false statement. Weather records show that a full moon had not occurred that night. According to the United States Naval Observatory, the moon phase on July 9, 1988, was waning crescent with 18% of the moon's visible disk illuminated. So only a sliver of the moon was visible that night, but only after 2.38 a.m. at moonrise. It was a dark night, and it illustrates an effect of embellishing her story over years of retelling and suggestive comments made by the detectives and others. She went on, and we paced back and forth. By, you know, 10 or 11 o'clock, we were really beginning to get worried, but she thought it was too late to call and alarm anyone, that, you know, we knew which direction they left, but we didn't know which direction to send anyone to possibly find them after that length of time. There was no cross-examination for Paula. She had said it was late and they were worried, and that is understandable. But a decade later, she went along with the state and pushed the lie that the three men were going to the Blue Hole. How did they not know where to send someone? This was not asked, because the defense lawyers feared that the jury might see them as attacking the grieving widow if they aggressively questioned Paula about difficult issues. This deceptive story about the men going to the Blue Hole continued to be presented as fact. Actually, Martha Mason and Paula Griffith Kirby never mentioned this in reporting the three men missing. The history of this case tells us that the men only had intentions of going for a ride and not to go swimming. If they had intended to end up at the Blue Hole, the women would have called someone to travel out to the Blue Hole that night. Contrary to the missing person report, no search teams had been sent into the Helican. No one had been seen by the Castiles and company while there on Sunday, July 10th. 
only two volunteers, Wayne Cox and Dave Ellis, had themselves decided to look in the Helican region at about the time the women made their report to Lieutenant Brown. The missing person report had been given at 6.25 p.m. The three had no plan of going to the Blue Hole. If that had been intended, Stanley Nixon would have traveled straight into the Helican that morning as he tracked the men. In fact, he never entered the trail going to the Blue Hole the morning of July 10, 1988. If the men had traveled that dirt trail, tracks would have been found along its several miles by this expert tracker. It would have been impossible to wipe out every sign along a three-mile trail. Lee Griffith, the brother of Kenneth Griffith, was called to the stand. He talked about July 9th and said that he and Kenneth had spent part of the day together. Kenneth told him, The plan was that he would be leaving about five or six in the morning because the truck they were, or they had borrowed, didn't have air conditioning in it and so they wanted to leave early to beat the heat back to Florida. He didn't describe a conversation about the blue hole. Mr. Griffith was asked how he had heard the news about the three missing men. He recalled, So Sunday we were just laying around. It was about, I guess, five or six o'clock, and I was just laying on the floor and flipping through the channels, and I come upon one of our channels here that has the writing on the bottom as they're speaking, and I seen the names. He had seen the names sometime after five o'clock on Sunday evening, July 10th. All this time had passed with him thinking his brother, Paula, and Earl had been traveling back to Florida. Something seems amiss. Apparently, neither of these worried women, nor anyone else, had thought to contact him that whole day. Lee Griffith was also one of the men Castile had helped out on Roberts Mill Road. He gave them a lift to Walker Road on July 10, 1988. Griffith was asked about the Jeep Scrambler that he rode in that day. He stated, I don't know, but I was leaning on the roll bar, and I was laying my head on the roll bar thinking, what was I going to tell Mom? And I noticed in the bed of the truck, this was, it had an oak slat bed in the truck, and it's got metal bands between the oak slats, and it was wet. This was untrue. The bed of the Jeep was, and always has been, metal. It was a scorching day, and no wetness would have persisted for any great amount of time. Castile and the girls had just come from swimming. Perhaps there was some remnant of that adventure, but he wished to suggest a connection with washing the bed. There was no police report or later statement that indicated any communication with the detectives about receiving help that day. His description of the event was from years of fermenting imagination. Stanley Nixon was the next prosecution witness. He declared that he was a hunter and tracker. The state was portraying him to be an expert witness. He said that Martha Mason called him at 9 o'clock a.m. that Sunday to inform him that the three men had not come home, hours after their intended departure that Lee Griffith had testified to earlier. Mason had Nixon's three-wheeler, so Nixon borrowed Herschel Green's four-wheeler to look for the three men. He said, Well, Dan, we went down to Walker Road. There's a campground at the foot of the hill, which it used to be Jake's campground. The approximately 115 acres was owned by Tom and Pam O'Neill, who lived near the town of Signal Mountain, about nine miles away. Nixon continued his description of the route he had followed to track the three men. He said he turned right onto a dirt trail off Walker Road. He described, I come through the trail. This is an asphalt or blacktop road. I came out here. They made a left, crossed the creek, and we went up on the upper side, crossed into Sequatchie County, made a loop and come back. At the creek, there's two crossings, and they went up on the right, come back on the left, and they come right back. They come right back to Vandergriff Road, and they come right back up. And when they got to the blacktop now, when the tracks got to the asphalt, that's the last, you know, I couldn't track them no more. I don't know where they went from there. Nixon's admission supports that the trip to the Blue Hole is a purely fabricated tale devised by the detectives and prosecution team a decade later for the trial. If the Blue Hole tale had been true, the women would have told Nixon about their intended destination. So when he lost their tracks at Vandergriff Road, he would have known where to go. On cross-examination, Judge Meyer would not allow the jury to hear of the confrontation between Hickman and Nixon and Mason. Neither would they hear how Nixon and Mason had been run off the Patton property, or that shots had been fired by Hickman or one of his boys. Nixon attempted to trivialize this confrontation, but his words failed to mask 
the potentially deadly interactions. His description of what had occurred included, When I was sitting over there, waiting to see what was going to happen when, you know, when Richard come, and I heard somebody, which it was Cecil, and I heard him holler, and there he goes down through the woods. Then he shot three times, and that kind of bothered me, because I slipped back around the hillside there, under it kind of crawled a long ways to where I could get back there, to where I could see Danny, his boy. He's the one who had the shotgun that day. The jury had not been allowed to hear any of this testimony. Don Poole asked, Well, did you say, I slipped back around the hillside there under it and kind of crawled a long ways. Why were you crawling? Nixon replied, Because I thought I might, he might shoot at me again or something, you know? I mean, this was an interesting answer, considering he denied that neither he nor Mason had been shot at that day. Nixon, in his statement, talked about another encounter that occurred some time after that confrontation with Hickman. Mason had spotted Hickman standing on the roadside when, in Nixon's words, Richard kind of made a dive at him with the truck, you know, just, and he uh, just kind of jumped out there in the road, and Hickman reached down in the bed, and he whipped out that old thirty eight he carries, you know. Nixon attempted to downplay this confrontation by characterizing this action. It was in kind of a joking manner. The state overlooked these threats of deadly acts of force by both men. Even if Mason had been joking, as Nixon declared, assault with a vehicle and pulling a gun on someone are serious matters. If Mason had done this, joking or not, to a police officer, it is likely he would have been charged with attempted murder or aggravated assault. After the jury had returned to the courtroom, the state speculated about how these bodies were taken over to the next county and dumped. They used Stanley Nixon to put forth the state's claim about the route taken to dump the bodies. But no credible evidence was presented to the jury that this route had been used. D.A. Cox questioned Nixon about how one could get from Signal Mountain to Suck Creek Mountain. At some point, he claimed, one could turn onto Brown's Chapel Road and then, going through the woods, negotiate very rough terrain to reach Big Fork. Mr. Cox asked him if this was a well-known route. The state tried to make it sound as if no one would have known this route. This is a false narrative. Nixon knew about it. Jerry Anderson and his son and Donna Taylor's friend knew about it. Depending on which story is true, anyone who used the dump certainly knew about this area. An interesting event had occurred before the bodies were found. Ricky Meeks, who had been helping with the search for the three men, stated in an interview with a private detective that he and Deputy Falter had gone over to Big Fork Road. He said they had searched different dump sites, stopping within a quarter mile of the dump site in which the men were later found. Obviously, Meeks knew of the route Nixon had described. An elderly white-haired man took the stand next. William Wiggins lived in Boston Branch, a gated community atop Signal Mountain. At the top of the mountain, Roberts Mill Road merges with Hickson Springs Road, the route to Boston Branch. A steel gate can be secured to block this county-maintained road. His one-page police interview was not dated like many of the statements taken in this investigation. According to Mr. Wiggins' court testimony, his statement was made on July 11, 1988. Detective Arrowwood had asked, Mr. Wiggins, when did you hear the shots we are talking about? This suggests they had been talking about this beforehand. Mr. Wiggins replied, On Saturday afternoon, which would have been the 9th of July, sometimes between probably 7.30 and 8.30 p.m., well, how many shots do you think you heard? I was thinking possibly around six, but, you know, reflecting back on it, possibly four to eight, somewhere in that series. Mr. Wiggins did not know what he had heard. He was questioned about where these shots came from in relation to his house. He replied, I'm not real positive. My thought is, you know, based on looking at the map and direction-wise, my reaction was they were to the west or the southwest of where I live possibly a fraction to the south. The detective steered him toward where they wanted him to indicate. Would that put it back to what we used to call the blue hole or back in the area of the power line? Mr. Wiggins' answer was revealing. My information was that it was on uh, in the area of the power line. He had been repeating what he had been told about the shots. At trial, he stated that he had heard five to eight shots that night and he was now able to point out where the shots had allegedly originated. It was brought out in cross-examination that he could not identify if it had only been one gun he had heard. 
Also it was revealed that he had said in his interview that he didn't know what kind of gun was being fired. What was not pointed out was the fact there is a wall of mature forest covering a 200-foot-high ridge between Mr. Wiggins' home and the gate area almost two miles away. Vince Brown took the stand and said that he had heard six or seven shots while on Hickson Springs Road that night. He said that he had heard this between the hours of 6 and 7 p.m., but this is different from what he reported to Officer Brown on Sunday, July 10, 1988. He had told Brown that he heard shots between 8 and 9 p.m. This is yet another indication of how the detectives and the prosecution had tailored the storyline by consultation with witnesses. The house he claimed to be at that night was about two miles away from the gate area. There are unknown factors here. This mountain region includes many gun owners. It would not be unusual to hear gunfire in and around the rural forested area. He was asked about seeing Castile driving up Roberts Mill Road on July 9th and if he had seen a collie dog. He replied, yes. He stated that when he had seen the Jeep that day, it was dirty. Like lines, he claimed to have seen the Jeep again at the command post on Monday, July 11, 1988, and it was clean. The state's own detective would prove his claim to be a lie. Detective Sneed later testified, Mr. Castile went with us from the command post. He rode in my car to Mr. Nunley's house. When we arrived, there was a green Jeep scrambler parked at the residence of Randy Nunley, at which time we asked, or asked Mr. Castile, if we could look at his vehicle. He gave permission to look at it. Castile's interrogation confirms this and reveals that the request to see the Jeep had come long before. He had agreed and requested a ride to Mr. Nunley's house. Castile had never returned to the command post after he left with Parham and Sneed on the 11th. The combination of hostility aimed at him and the carnival atmosphere gave him no reason to return. Janice Hall was another prosecution witness, but she corroborated what Castile stated in his interrogation. Bill Cox asked, Was there something there that caused problems with your sleeping that particular night? Mrs. Hall replied, We heard tire sounds that woke us up during the middle of the night. It was around 3 o'clock, 3 or 4 in the morning. She then told how when she had gotten up that morning, she had seen the Jeep Scrambler going towards Roberts Mill Road. In cross-examination, Phil Lawrence asked, Mrs. Hall, when you were coming down out of your bedroom at 6 or whatever time it was in the morning and looked out the window and saw this Jeep passing in front of your house, did you hear that sound of tires? She answered, I did not notice it at that time. She also confirmed that a woman had been driving and a collie had been in the back. In her statement to Parham and Sneed in October of 1990, Parham asked if she remembered what time she had seen the woman driving the Jeep Scrambler. She replied, I would say around 6.30 or 7 a.m. It was just shortly after daylight. Mr. Lawrence inquired, Mr. Cox asked you about the interval, that is, the space of time between when you would be aroused on one occasion to the next by these sounds. Now, are you saying that on occasion when you heard the tires and they passed, and then you heard them coming back the opposite direction, there would be a 20-minute interval between hearing them go one way and coming back the other? About that length of time. This would become an overlooked fact when the state made one of several changes in their theory. The state tried to make it seem that this unseen vehicle and the scrambler were one and the same. Her testimony, just the opposite, did not even suggest this. Her testimony backed up what Castile had said in his interview about taking the dog home. The news coverage of the trial was highly slanted in favor of the prosecution. When they reported Janice Hall hearing tire sounds through the night, they made no mention of her statement that when she saw Castile's Jeep that morning, she had not heard those sounds. The state purposely neglected to call Mr. Hall to the stand because his testimony would have dismantled their false narrative. Mr. Hall had been questioned in 1990 by Detective Parham, and during the morning hours, did you have the occasion to look to see what was passing by? Hall replied, I looked out several times. I did see a pickup truck at one time, or what looked like a pickup truck, pass by once, earlier in the morning about between three and four, I'd say. Did it make a sound similar to what you had been hearing? It made a similar sound to that. The sound had only been heard when a pickup truck was seen traveling the road. The next witness to the stand was a heavy-set old man. 
Herschel Green was testifying about what he had not seen. Mr. Green's porch, where he claimed to have been sitting, is about 350 feet from Vandergriff Road. Trees blocked his line of sight. He said he knew Castile drove in early that morning because he recognized the sound of a four-cylinder engine. The scrambler did not run on a four-cylinder engine. A six-cylinder engine powered the scrambler. The witness had not seen anything. Mr. Green was asked by D.A. Cox, All right, and had you been home that evening of July 9, 1988, or had you been someplace else? Green replied, No, I've been down to eat at the country place restaurant in Red Bank, and got back, and I guess I got home between 7.30 and 8 o'clock. This is the same time Mr. Wiggins stated he heard shots. This would also be about the same time other people, like Joe Skinner, reported hearing shots. But in cross-examination, Mr. Green said he heard no gunshots when he arrived home. Also, he confirmed that he had heard nothing unusual that night. James Walling was the state's next witness. Mr. Davis requested that he introduce himself to the jury. He stated, My name is James Walling, and I live on Signal Mountain. I am a good friend of Richard's. He testified he lived on Sawyer Road and had left to go to work on the morning of July 10, 1988, around 6.10 a.m., and while driving on Roberts Mill Road, he had passed Castile's Jeep with no lights on. On cross-examination, the attempted sinister implication was deflated when he admitted it was daylight when he passed the Jeep Scrambler. Walling was asked on cross-examination by Mr. Poole, And when you were telling Detective Rottery what Jeff Mann told you about his encounter, that recent encounter with Frank Castile, you quoted Jeff Mann as saying that Frank Castile was pretty nice to Jeff Mann and the Mills boy. His reply, No, I don't see that in my report. Mr. Poole approached the witness to show him his statement. With the statement in his hand, he still denied saying or even seeing the words. His statement reads in part, Have you ever seen Castile with a gun or anything? No. Martha's sister's little boy was in there Saturday, and they said when he got out to his Jeep that he had a shotgun. Is that the Mills? He was with the Mills boy. Said he had a shotgun and he had it in his hand like this. And he said they got out of the truck and started walking around here, and Castile brought it up like this and said, don't come any closer. I don't know you boys. And they said he was pretty nice to them. He just made them leave. The state called Mildred Hines to the stand. She testified that on July 9, 1988, she had arrived at her home on Vandergriff Road around dusky dark. According to the U.S. Naval Observatory Astronomical Applications Department, sunset on the 9th would have been at 8.57 p.m. She had gotten out of her car to open the gate. That's when she saw a jeep pass by with ATVs in the back, she explained. Davis devoted much of his time trying to lead her to the answers he wanted. For example, Mrs. Hines had only stated she had seen a jeep pass. She had not said that it was Castile's jeep. So Davis tried to lead her answer to Castile. Davis asked, Okay, and previous to this occasion, on other occasions, had you? Had you seen the vehicle known as Mr. Castile's vehicle? going up and down the road before? Mrs. Hines replied, Yes, I've seen him, you know, go up and down the road. On cross-examination, she stated that at the time, she and her husband had been living in Florida part of the time and on Signal Mountain. Mr. Poole asked, Okay, Mr. Davis asked you if you had seen the Jeep before. Had you seen it before? I don't think so, no. The defense failed to clearly point out the fact that she had said in her interview it was not Castile's Jeep that she had seen that afternoon. She had seen Castile's Jeep pass by many times, but she had not recognized the Jeep that passed by that day. But this defense-supporting testimony did not matter to the state. They just disregarded her proof in the closing argument. Larry Sneed was recalled to the stand. So that afternoon when Castile came there, he had come with a friend by the name Randy Nunley. Lee Davis inquired about how the logbook had come into his possession. Sneed replied, It was Monday, July the 11th. It was at the home of his friend Randy Nunley. We had went to that location to look at Mr. Castile's Jeep Scrambler, and laying inside the Jeep Scrambler between the seats was this logbook. Sneed said the numbers and words early encounters had not been added to the logbook. The numbers are a complete fabrication. 
You can look at the handwriting and tell that Castile did not write the numbers in the logbook. Those were added later, after Castile had turned it over to them. A handwriting expert could have attested to this fact. Further, the application of these numbers contributed no logical or methodical ordering of the instances of trespassing, the purpose of the journal. Entries had been listed chronologically to accommodate essential historic data, as suggested by Lieutenant Brown. These numbers had been added, including some sequential oddities, in the decade of police possession, perhaps by investigators or prosecutors. Davis requested a bench conference where he stated, What I would like to do at this time is there are portions of the videotape that I think would be parallel to Sneed's testimony about where the different scenes are and some of the distances involved, which we believe is relevant. Judge Meyer then sent the jury out of the courtroom so the video could be reviewed to decide what the jury would be allowed to see. The state had paid $1,000 to QV Production Company to make a video reimagination. They had not been allowed to show the video during their opening statement as they had intended. The judge wanted to review this video before the jury could see it. The production contained elements that other courts have ruled inadmissible, elements such as pictures of the three men and unproven, wholly imagined actions. The unsubstantiated dramatization was highly prejudicial. Their dramatization began with a wide shot of downtown Chattanooga fading to a view of the courthouse. A view of Signal Mountain fades to a close-up of a creek flowing with water. You are then presented with contrasting views of the blue hole, changing to a view of the power line. The next shot is labeled as Castile Campsite, where Castile's picture zooms into the middle of the screen. Different views of the logbook then come in, filling the screen. The dramatization continued with a view at the Mason home, then photos of each of the three men faded into view. Detectives Larry Sneed, Gary Gaskell, and Caldwell Huckabee from the district attorney's office are seen riding ATVs down the driveway and then turning left onto Walker Road. They are then shown turning right onto some dirt path where they travel through the woods and quickly reaching Vandergriff Road. Ignoring the route that Nixon had tracked and had testified about turning left instead of right on Vandergriff Road. In this fantasy, the men quickly arrived at the gate. Sneed walked approximately 50 paces from the trail in one direction and pointed out two different spots. Then he took about 20 paces from the trail in the other direction and pointed to one place. He was pointing to areas where blood was alleged to have been found. We have no proof of this because no detailed sketch of the alleged crime scene was ever recorded. No measured drawing had been turned over in discovery. The implication that the ATVs had been ridden on Castile's property was highly prejudicial. Mr. Lawrence addressed the court regarding the introduction of this misleading video to the jury and being entered into evidence. Mr. Lawrence pointed out to the previous testimony of Nixon that had been inconsistent with what the state's video drama displayed. Let me make one point, and unfortunately the court wasn't able to observe what Mr. Nixon pointed to because the map is not facing your honor. I would like for the court's record to reflect that the area that Mr. Nixon followed, this trail is the opposite direction of the Helican Road. The jury had been brought back after the judge had ruled that part of the video could be presented to the jury. One part of Meyer's ruling had been that the sound had to be muted while the jury viewed the tape. The reason for muting the sound had been to derail the prosecution's attempt to slip in a low ominous sound in the background of their work of fiction. Davis questioned Sneed about finding the gate area. Actually, he had been led to the gate by individuals with a pre-planned agenda. Sneed said, well, We were going to take a break in this area, in this area right here. Sneed pointed to a picture of the gate area on a TV screen that was next to the witness stand. A small portion, or a drop of what appeared to be blood, was found by the gate post. The road at the gate area was very clean, cleaner than any other area of the Helican Road. Looking at the area of the gate that day, it appeared that someone had actually took a branch and swept the road. This is false. Disregarding regular trespassers, at least 44 tires had driven over that area, churning the dirt in the two days before this alleged walk. Two state's witnesses, Dave Ellis and Wayne Cox, had driven along the trail, carefully watching for signs of the men. They had not noticed a swept and manicured area in the trail. 
Even Griffith's brother had early on described the gate area as tore up. Davis asked him what he had done after finding this. Sneed said, well, I followed the drag marks to where they came to an end, and after seeing the flies and maggots, I started uncovering the leaves, at which time I uncovered a large pool of blood or large pool that appeared to be blood. He stated that a cadaver dog had been brought in and it had found a pool in the middle of the gate on the trail. Sneed took credit for all that had been found. He explained how careful they had been to protect this supposed crime scene, but the reality was, according to Eddie Brown's and Donnie Harris's interview, that this had not been a meticulous search and collection. In fact, it was just the opposite. It is interesting to note that Sneed's version of events is what you see on the Hollywood production of Unsolved Mysteries. Consider what Donnie Harris said about how careful they had been at the alleged crime scene. He gave a statement to Detectives Baker and Hawkins on August 22, 1988. Mr. Harris opined, well, I happened to kick a limb, and there was a fly come out of it. When I looked down, they was crawling, you know, a big pile of round leaves. Found two piles of blood up in here that had been covered up, and I marked it. So before that, though, I had found a rock over here. Here's where you he found all the stuff. And there's a rock out there, and it had a black mark on it. Well, I picked that up and set it in the van and marked where I found it. Mr. Harris was asked, did you do anything to the pile of blood? I covered it back up, put a marker on it. Why did you cover it back up? Because they told us to. Mr. Harris said nothing about Detective Sneed being around when he stepped in blood and then covered it up. An untrained local picking up a rock and moving it to the van was not protecting a crime scene. People were taking things from one scene, like a raincoat and a plastic grocery bag. You have people finding blood by stepping in it, then covering it up tainting the area as he moved around, and then this guy was picking up a rock and moving it. Mr. Poole, while cross-examining Sneed, inquired, In fact, as part of your investigation, did some studies as to whether or not you could hear gunshots from the blue hole, did you not? Sneed said, From the blue hole, you cannot hear a shot. He tried to explain why he was not able to hear shots that day. And the day that the tests were done at the blue hole? It was a day after several days of rain. That day at the Blue Hole or the creek or whatever was high, rolling, making lots of noise. I was the one that went down to that area. And when I, as I went down and uh, I saw it was much rougher than it was back when I was there. After Sneed had given this false explanation, this is what proceeded. Well, and certainly it was important for you to know whether anyone could hear from the Blue Hole, wasn't it? Yeah, that's correct. And I guess you waited for the water to go down? to go back out and get some more tests, didn't you? No. This test was performed on August 3, 1988, according to a report dated August 23, 1988, and signed by Perham and Sneed. This was the same day law enforcement and two biased civilians served a search warrant on the property. Larry Sneed purposely lied on the stand about the creek roaring the day he performed these tests. It was not the day after several days of rain. According to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, there had been no rainfall at all on the test date or the two days prior, and indeed the total rainfall for the preceding five days was only 0.28 inches. The rainfall over the five days preceding the men's ATV ride was very similar at 0.19 inches. The small amount of rain that fell would not have caused the creek to be roaring or even have raised its level. The water in that long section of the creek flowed mostly below the rocks. A subterranean flow typically filled the blue hole. Extremely heavy and long periods of rain were required to raise the water above the rocks. It was one of the many non-navigable watercourses in Tennessee. Sneed went on to say the reason no tests had been done on the shotgun to see if it had been recently fired was that it looked cleaned. That shotgun had not been cleaned and he could not know by just looking. They wanted it to go untested so they could more easily claim its use in a crime. Checking to see if the shotgun had been fired was not the only thing for which the gun could have been tested. For instance, it could have been tested for the presence of blood. The Jeep was tested for blood, and they alleged it had been cleaned. Castile's hands and clothes could also have been tested for gunshot residue. Continuing the cross-examination of Detective Sneed, 
Don Poole asked about obtaining fingerprints from Castile. All right, and you took those for comparison to see whether anything on an ATV or anything else that you could compare his fingerprints with, did you not, sir? Sneed replied, that's correct. He went on to say that the comparisons had been inconclusive. This was a purposely misleading answer, a tactic employed by District Attorney Cox and by Davis. The results had not been inconclusive. They had conclusively not matched any state evidence. The TBI lab report, dated September 12, 1988, with Castile listed as the subject, stated, On August 25, 1988, the Nashville TBI Crime Laboratory received from James Baker the following evidence for examination. The lab report listed Exhibits 29 through 33. Exhibits 29 and 30 were fingerprint cards bearing the finger and palm prints of Frank and Linda Castile. The lab results stated, The previously developed latent palm impression from Exhibit 2, the ATV, was compared with Exhibits 29 and 30 with no identifications. These results are clearly not inconclusive. Sneed purposely misstated the result. The report stated, with no identifications, they were not a match. Sneed was asked by Dollar Davis, Okay, and did you, let me just ask you directly, did you take possession of that logbook from Mr. Castile on July 11th? Sneed said, Yes, I did. It was Monday, July the 11th. Castile's Jeep Scrambler was at the home of his, uh, a friend named Randley Nunley. We'd went to that location to look at Mr. Castile's Jeep Scrambler, and laying inside the Jeep Scrambler between the seats was this logbook. Castile had told the detectives earlier about the logbook and disclosed its whereabouts. Sneed's answer proved that the stories told by Vince Brown and another witness who will be discussed later were lies. They both fabricated the false claim that Castile had been with his jeep at the command post on Monday, July 11, 1988. Showing his ignorance of the property lines, Sneed stated while reviewing the map of the property, all Castile's property runs down to the edge of the blue hole. I don't think it actually took in the water. Either he lacked comprehension of what the map indeed indicated, or was he intentionally helping the prosecution to mislead the jury. Everything points to the latter, but a combination of the two is probably the case. Mr. Poole questioned Sneed about the alleged manicured area at the gate. This is what proceeded. Okay, and this is the area that you've described to the jury as being manicured or whatever? Yes, sir. Are we looking at that now? Yes, sir. Where they're standing there, yeah, that's where the picture was taken. Well, not now. That's after we'd been there. Well, I'm saying right now, though, I'm looking at what you would describe as being manicured. That area, this is across the gate. This is rough, this rock's over here. Where they're standing in that area beyond the gate... That's the area that appeared to someone had took a brush. This is coming on through the gate right here. This is rocks, and its angle's coming in. You would angle to your left over here, and the other side is where the area, it appeared that someone had took a brush and swept across. Well, let me just ask you this while we're going. Did you take a picture of that on the other side that you're talking about? I did not take a photograph, no. Except in his acting role. Okay, did anybody within your control... Your and Detective Params take a picture of what you have indicated is the manicure area, unless we're looking at it now? No. If this confused you, don't worry. It confused me and probably a lot of people who were there, including the jury. Basically, all that indicated that there was no evidence of this so-called manicured area. There were no pictures to back up this claim, just his memory that would be taxed throughout the trial. The jury was sent out of the courtroom. The defense tried to get Judge Meyer to allow them to put other leads before the jury. Sneed was questioned about the informant they had purposely paraded out in front of other prisoners. The young man's life had been put in danger because of Sneed's actions. Sneed had been well aware of how he was thwarting the offered evidence. The defense asked about another lead that revealed the offending shotgun had been pawned. The TBI had passed this info on to Perham and Sneed, but they never bothered to check it out. Also, Parham and Sneed had been informed about yet another lead. A woman from Ray County had contacted the detectives and supplied several names of people she claimed had been involved in the killings. The detectives had been told this person had given reliable information before in other cases. 
they just neglected to pursue this trail. Mr. Poole inquired about numerous other leads for which Sneed had either very little or no memory of the details. If it would not implicate Castile, they had no interest in pursuing the trail. Prosecutors would twist this negligence into an exhaustive investigation. The defense asked about Hickman and three people who had a confrontation with him, and they presented evidence to show that the tractor pull had not been held on July 9, 1988, as Hickman had stated. But Meyer would not allow any alternate perpetrator or exculpating evidence to be shown to the jury. Because their case was so weak, the state did not want anything presented to the jury that would oppose their own theory and claims. Judge Doug Meyer had no intention of allowing any alternate theory to be presented to the jury. Sneed talked about how he allegedly had verified that Mr. Hickman had attended a tractor pull on July 9, 1988. Poole questioned Sneed. Let me ask you one thing about that. Did you verify that there was a tractor pull that weekend? Sneed indicated he had verified this information by a billboard and ticket. Here is what proceeded. Do you have that in your file or something, sir? No, sir. Where is that? Well, I'm sure there's notes of it. Well, I would like, if you have anything, or your office or the district attorneys, to verify there was a tractor pull, other than talking to his family and this minister who said he didn't remember the exact time he was up there. Of course, neither Sneed nor the state ever produced a scintilla of evidence. Unfortunately, the defense attorneys never pushed them to provide the evidence they alleged. Meyer had the jury called back into the courtroom. Ronnie Lewis was called as a state witness. Holding all police statements and his interview notes in his hand, the prosecutor was well acquainted with the testimony that Castile's brother-in-law would give. He would confirm what he had averred in 1988, first to the police and then to the district attorney. But Davis boldly misrepresented testimony and twisted it beyond reality. It was he who declared the state's fallacy that what Ronnie had seen at the camp near the power line had been out of the ordinary. Ronnie explained that on Sunday morning, he and Brenda had first driven to Hardy's restaurant. Planning to visit the Castiles on the property, they wanted to treat them to breakfast. But empty chairs welcomed the couple to the familiar campsite. So amid the typical outfit of coolers, cots, canteens filled with water, and lanterns, they made themselves comfortable. The camp was vacant, but obviously in use, and only moments had passed when Frank strode from the woods into the clearing. Linda had not yet returned from taking the dog home. This was a subject of conversation when the jeep came drifting down the trail. Relaxing discourse and laughter was enjoyed until they all departed in the afternoon. The prosecution had contrived to control questioning Ronnie. They would design the line of questions, and the defense could only cross-examine on what the DA had introduced. Davis knew that his criticism, had he waited to challenge him as a defense witness, would have had a limited negative impact on the jury. And so, offering no corroboration beyond his self-serving recitation, he attacked his witness and deceptively proclaimed that Ronnie had changed his account of events. It had been a tactical maneuver to discredit an important witness early on to degrade any probative value for the defense. Out of the ordinary was imagination scripted by the state's attorney. He made an issue of Frank not having been in the small campsite when the couple arrived. He had not come down the trail that moments before they had driven along, but he had soon emerged from the woods on the way back from the latrine. Moreover, there were greater than 130 acres of land to explore, Castile was not a couch potato, which, like the prosecutor, would have ignored free moments to roam those acres. Prosecutors proclaimed conflicting self-serving fake facts. One argued that Castile would ordinarily be at the campsite, while the other portrayed him as being stationed at the gate. Seeming to have no common sense regarding woodscraft or remote camping, the state presented their own irrational thinking as factual evidence. Another issue, they claimed, was that no fire had been burning upon the couple's arrival. Although Castile had not been long away from the camp, he would have fully quenched any flame. His children and every true scout would be aware of this safety precaution. Only the most ignorant or foolish person would have left a fire unattended, as Davis declared, would have been ordinary. A fire would have been a hazard because the forest was dangerously dry after a long period without rain. Defense attorneys were reluctant to offer specific challenges to expose the prosecution's purposeful misstatements and illusions. 
they seemed naive enough to believe the jury was sufficiently capable of recognizing supposition, innuendo, and imagination. At times we wondered if the attorneys themselves could identify the state's use of contrived testimony, misrepresented geographic locations, vague distances, misstated test results and identifications, and the prosecution's made-up facts. Dr. Frank King, the medical examiner who had performed the autopsies on Smock, Mason, and Griffith, was called to the stand. While questioning Dr. King, Cox staged another little performance for the jury. An assistant pointed Castile's shotgun and pretended to shoot Cox, who stood near him. When Cox fell to the floor, his assistant stepped close and again pointed the gun towards Cox and fired. Cox, in turn, pretended to have been shot. This was identical to how the Unsolved Mysteries production team had portrayed the scene. Both Cox and Hollywood had ignored the TBI finding that the shots had come from a distance of 5 to 20 feet. Mr. Cox requested that Dr. King step down and sit in a chair that had been placed in front of the jury. I would request that you not point it at my head, Dr. King admonished. You would be surprised how many people are shot with unloaded guns. D.A. Cox had received a gun safety lesson from the medical examiner, and it would not be the last. Even after the request had been made, Mr. Cox proceeded to aim the gun toward Dr. King. Mr. Cox said, Do you have any idea how far away this shot occurred from? He was referring to Griffith's head wound. Dr. King replied, No, all I have is a defect going through the skull. Lee Griffith was quoted in the local news on July 12, 1988 as saying his brother Kenneth and Mr. Smock could not have been easily overpowered because they were respectively six feet four inches tall and six feet six inches tall and in the best shape of their lives. The angles and trajectory of the shots were never determined according to established practices well known in 1988. No evidence revealed either actions or a sequence of events that might have occurred. For instance, there could have been more than one shooter. The medical examiner had confirmed that. Only the prosecution's fantasy defined the events. The state claimed that Earl Smock had been shot, ran away, and then fell. I think that is downplaying the possibility of a showing of aggression. Smock very well could have knocked someone down, and a shooter could have been lying on the ground. I don't know. Frank Castile does not know. And by their later admission, the state does not know how this occurred. Only the killers or killer and these three men knew. Consider this example. A liquor store was located on Rossville Boulevard in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Two men owned this store, and someone came in to rob them. The robber had instructed them to lie on the floor. One of the men was shot dead. The other man knew that he too would die if he did nothing. So he jumped up and fought the robber. The man lived because he fought back. He was lucky because during this struggle, he too was shot. The point is, the threat spurred the owner to action. There are numerous possibilities regarding how and why these men were killed. It could have involved multiple guns and exchanged gunfire. All three men could have been shot at the same instant. It could have happened someplace other than the gate area. There is no evidence of the provocation or action that led to their deaths. Everything the state presented to the jury was assumptions, unsubstantiated claims, and pure imagination. The state offered its theory with no corroborating evidence, but Judge Meyer prevented the defense from developing their own theory in court. So only a tamed pushback from the defense attorneys who essentially adopted the state's theory into their defense strategy. Local attorneys, judiciary, and the DA staff are friends and colleagues. Again, I believe outside lawyers would have doggedly challenged the state and the judge and highlighted their misdeeds and misconduct. At this time, Dr. King revealed some shocking news during his testimony. He had never visited the gate area that had been labeled a crime scene. He stated regarding items presented to him, Well, I was just told from a wooded area on Signal Mountain. I didn't go up to the area. I'm not really familiar with the area of the gate. So, everything that had been taken to him, evidence easily could have been planted, but certainly tainted by untrained local biased volunteers. They had trampled the area and collected, as Harris and Brown had illustrated. In testimony, Dr. King talked about things that had been brought to him in the days leading up to the discovery of the bodies. 
He had been asked to look at a bone chip that had been recovered from one of the three-wheelers. He had told them to send it to the TBI to learn if it was human or animal, but the detectives ignored this advice. The ATVs had come into contact with a myriad of material at the illegal dump site. The police knew this and purposely neglected proper identification of alleged bone chips, tissue, etc. No related lab reports were proffered in discovery. Prosecutors utilized the advantage of having no scientific proof to insert their self-serving speculation. So, three men had been shot. One headshot created a single entrance and exit hole. Dr. King explained that internal pressure had fractured portions of the skull, but only a few tiny fragments of bone were recovered from one of the three-wheelers. No fragments were found and recovered at the gate area, where they claimed these men had been killed. Dr. King stated, I was asked to look at some clear plastic bags that contained some dirt and leaves and a dark fluid and maggots mixed in together. I was also asked to look at some soft tan tissue. It looked like tissue to my eye. It was also mixed in with a little dirt and maggots. And I was asked to give an opinion whether that was something that might be related to a crime scene or might be related to tissue or fluid from human bodies. My opinion was that the bag that contained the dirt and leaves and dark fluid and maggots to my eye looked like blood. He then said he could not determine if this was human or animal blood. Plus, he could not say what the tissue was and from where it came. He then advised that it be sent to the TBI. No lab report shows any tissue or bone being found in any of the samples. Dr. King had not tested anything that allegedly came from the gate area or anywhere else for that matter, he only gave his opinion. Dr. King talked about Kenneth Griffith's wound. Now a single projectile could be one of a group of shot pellets, the one that just happened to strike the head, the other shot pellets completely missing the head, or possibly going through other parts of the head we don't have present. To assist the DA, Dr. King had deviated from his autopsy notations his modified theory neglects the TBI determination of distance and patterns. Neither is it supported by his autopsy detail drawing. Dr. King continued, Another possibility is a shotgun firing from a single projectile called a slug. He related another possibility. This could be a projectile from a handgun shooting a lead-type bullet that hits the head in this fashion, or even from a hunting rifle. That sort of thing could produce this type of injury. So I cannot prove what the projectile was, except that it made this pattern of injury and has its lead on it. This theory would necessarily involve the bullet casing photographed at the dump site where the bodies had been found. Further, Dr. King ignored his advice to the detectives. He had recommended that they get a lab test to determine if lead was present. Other ballistic metals have a similar appearance. But in regard to lead, the doctor, who was never a forensic authority, had issued supposition as fact. Dr. King, in my view, was trying to downplay what he had said in the actual autopsy report. In that document, he had proclaimed, The physical characteristics of the entrance and exit wounds to the skull and the overall skin fracture pattern strongly suggest a single high-powered projectile from a hunting rifle, a military assault rifle, or a high-powered large-caliber handgun. He had to downplay what he had initially reported to help the state. Their latest theory was that all three men had been killed with a shotgun. The physical size of a 12-gauge slug exceeds the recorded wound size. They had issued a search warrant for a rifle, but a decade later, the prosecutor had concocted a scheme whereby a single shotgun had been systematically loaded with different types of rounds, including a slug. Dr. King did acknowledge, on cross-examination, that there was a strong possibility that up to three guns could have been used in killing these three men. So one must assume a strong possibility that there had been more than one shooter. During Dr. King's testimony, the state purposely destroyed yet another piece of evidence. With no gloves on his hands, District Attorney Bill Cox yanked evidence out of a plain paper bag. He flailed Earl Smock's flight suit in front of the jurors. Parts of this suit contacted the floor and brushed against Cox, contaminating the suit. Earlier, Mr. Cox had opened an envelope containing birdshot, then poured the contents onto his bare hand. The evidence ended up in a pile on the courtroom floor. Kelly Fite, who
who worked for the Georgia Bureau of Investigation, was next on the stand. Detective Larry Sneed had taken the shotgun to him to make comparisons of the shotgun wad and ammo to see if it could be traced back to Castile's shotgun. Taking cues from the prosecution, Mr. Fight claimed that the barrel of the shotgun was perfect and so produced no markings that could match to the collected evidence. The tests could not connect Castile's shotgun with the killings. Kelly Fight had told the defense lawyers before trial that he had nothing that could harm their client. On the stand, Mr. Fight espoused the idea that the barrel of Castile's shotgun was free of defects. He assisted the state by stating this in a way that implied Castile's shotgun was a rare phenomenon. The 1964 Journal of Criminal Law and Criminology included a paper titled Identification of Shotguns by Fired Shells, written by R. P. Rastogi, a firearms identification expert. He states, in part, In factory-made weapons, the chamber is generally smooth and cylindrical in perfection, its characteristics are not prominent enough to leave an identifying impression on the shot shell. A publication entitled Engineering Production, published in January 1921, discussed the mass production of guns. It reads in part, There are 168 operations on each barrel, this number being made up in the following manner, 56 on both the left and right hand tubes, and a further 56 on the two assembled tubes, these operations in the majority of cases being very intricate and calling for the highest possible degree of accuracy. This also applies to every other component, but it will be realized on examining some of these processes that the possibility of error is very remote. This nonsense that the state, along with Mr. Fight, had put forth that the barrel of the gun free of any defects is a rare thing was deceptive. There are multitudes of shotguns with defect-free barrels. For instance, all the new shotguns for sale in numerous stores across the country or guns properly cared for could meet this criteria. Mr. Fight admitted he could not say how many guns would have a defect-free barrel. The previous paragraph was written in 1921. If they were so precise then, how much more precise would it have been in the 1980s? In reference to the five fired shot shells found near the gate area, Attorney Phil Lawrence inquired if Mr. Fight was also given the opportunity to test the shot shells Mr. Best from the TBI had tested. Did you receive any spent cartridges? No. And you weren't given the opportunity to run any of these tests on the spent cartridges? No. Lee Davis jumped up and cried, Objection! A bench conference was held. Mr. Davis said, Right, our objection is he said, Were you told there was a cartridge from the crime scene? that was not given to you for testing or something, inferring that we did not give him. There was an old cartridge collected from the woods. It was not part of this case. Mr. Lawrence said, I don't know. They collected evidence. I don't know how. I wasn't there to collect it. I'm asking the question. I don't know the answer. The shot shells that had been found were tested and showed that they had not been fired from Castile's shotgun. Davis said they were just old shot shells that were in the woods. There are no pictures of these shells and they were probably destroyed. All we have is a TBI report. The report does not state that these were old shells. If these shells had been fired from Castile's gun, this just old cartridges would not have been argued by the state. These professional detectives gathered these shell casings and had them tested because they had been viable evidence. Because the forensics did not support their tale, they alleged the casings to have had nothing to do with the case. In their arrogance, they dismissed pursuit of physical evidence, such as the high-powered bullet casing found with the bodies. We can never know what gun had fired that bullet because they did not test this bit of evidence. And neither the purse and shoes, nor the pilfered raincoat and bag with unknown contents had been worthy of pursuit. I thought at the time, and I still do, that the harassment letters Castile had received through the years and the extortion threats should have been part of the defense's argument. The phone calls were threatening in nature. The woman on the phone said that she, and the man with whom she was having an affair, would talk if they were not paid a large amount of cash. Castile had refused to pay these criminals because he knew he had done nothing wrong. Up next, Jerry and Donna Anderson were called to the stand. They were now married, but had been married to other people in 1988. 
They had been partners in an affair in July of 1988. Jerry Anderson and his wife had divorced sometime in 1989, and Donna Taylor's divorce had happened sometime in 1990. On the stand, both had pulled Donny Castile's picture out of a photo array. They both claimed it was the same photo they had picked out years earlier. But in Jerry Anderson's statement, the detectives had not recorded the person he had picked out, as they had done in other interviews. It was not until a year later, when he and Donna Taylor were talking with Parham, that it was revealed who he allegedly picked out of this uncorroborated lineup. Mr. Anderson testified that he and Donna Taylor, his mistress at the time, went into the woods late that night, or the early hours of July 10th, looking for his son in the Big Fork area. But he had not said looking for his son in his 1988 statement. His story had changed without the prosecutor's objection. He had told Parham in 1988, See, that's why I was up there looking for a friend of hers. I didn't want my wife to know about all this. You know what I'm saying. My wife wouldn't understand, you know. I wondered just who they had been looking for that night. His memory had been recent when he had given the statement. This revision may have been adopted to protect her friend. On cross-examination, the defense attorney pointed out that in his statement, he had been unsure of what and who he saw that night. Mr. Anderson replied, I wasn't really sure what I said. I mean, like I said, it was a dark, moonlit night, but I remember the image of the face. There was very little moonlight that night, and the moon had not yet risen. At the time he claimed to have seen this person, there had been no moonlight at all to reflect off anything. Anderson said this vehicle had come up, at which point the driver said five words, Sorry about holding you up, and he went on. Throughout Mr. Anderson's cross-examination, he displayed an arrogant and argumentative attitude. One example. Mr. Lawrence said, Now I didn't understand you to say that you had been in this area before. Mr. Anderson replied, Well, I said I'd been out there with my son. Evidently you wasn't listening. May not have been. Evidently. Mr. Lawrence had questioned Mr. Anderson about his answer he had given when Parham had asked, Could you tell if he had anything on the jeep? He had replied, no, you couldn't see anything. All I really is a little window on the side that was down, you know? And his face is all, I'm saying, you know, being dark and still. My lights were, you know, on and his were on, but still, you know, from my lights and all his, you know, I think my friend would be able to help you more because she says really, you know, she saw him too, you know. His answer begins with, you couldn't see anything and ends with, I think my friend would be able to help you more. There is no clear indication that he was able to identify anyone positively. Donna Taylor Anderson was called to the stand. She had given her statement a year after Jerry Anderson. Donna was asked on cross-examination, You were married to someone else at the time, is that right? She answered, I was separated. Separated? You got divorced sometime after you gave the statement, didn't you? Mr. Davis intervened, No relevance. The court agreed. Remember this when the sheriff's working mistress, Marie Hill, is called to the stand. Mrs. Anderson was questioned about being coached before the interview started. In her statement, Parham had said, I believe that we reached the conclusion that it was the proper date because you have stated that you found out about the disappearance of the three missing men. Even then, her story was being groomed. Later, Mr. Lawrence asked, Explain this, please referring to her statement. Detective Parham makes the statement, Okay, we showed you a group of pictures, five, six, seven photographs of various people. Is that the quantity of photographs you looked at on August 1st, 1989? Mrs. Anderson replied, I don't know. Well, apparently there are ten photographs here today that have been represented to comprise the photo lineup that you were shown at the time. Do you recognize those as being the photographs you saw on August 1st, 1989? I don't know if they're the same or not, but I know the one picture is definitely the same. The fact she could not say the lineup was the same calls into question the reliability of this alleged identification, not to mention the apparent influence the detectives had in making the identification. Further, Parham had declared the number of photos. The array at trial was clearly different. In a later bench conference, Judge Meyer stated, Well, I really shouldn't participate. But I think you all are barking up the wrong tree. I don't think the young man was up there on the mountain. Even the hanging judge 
who was a cheerleader for the state, had not believed the Andersons' tall tale. Margaret Bash worked in the crime lab in Nashville at the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation. Mrs. Bash stated that on July 13, 1988, she received four plastic Ziploc bags identified as from 25 feet north of the gate that contained dirt, leaves, pine needles, and live maggots but she only tested one of the bags. She had not listed bone fragments or tissue. The scientist would have indeed noted such elements. She laid one bag in an enclosed area that exhausts all the air to protect the lab. She cut a slit and then swirled a cotton swab inside the bag. After that, she taped the hole back up. The swab tested positive for human blood staining. Then all this evidence was destroyed. She talked about a bag that came to the lab on July 20th, 1988. This had been labeled as In the Gateway C5. It, too, tested positive for human blood staining. She later told the defense that she could have frozen swabs for preservation, but that had not been done. This removed any chance for anyone to do any future testing. This report contained reference codes such as C5, C6, and CP1 with no explanation and description of what these codes refer to. She was asked by defense attorney Poole, and in your experience in dealing with trained homicide detectives and police that would be able to look visually to make an observation? She replied, yes. Parham and Sneed had been allowed to do just that on Monday, July 11, 1988, when Castile allowed them to inspect the Jeep. She described how she sprayed the Jeep with luminol, this is a test used to detect the presence of blood staining. In her report, dated August 26, 1988, she stated that tests failed to indicate the presence of blood staining. Castile had driven down Roberts Mill Road late on Sunday evening, July 10, 1988. He had been on the way home after taking his daughter and her friend to the Castile property to swim. He stopped to help some men stuck on the side of the mountain. Then he gave some of the men a lift to Walker Road, but it was not then apparent that his good deed had been a real risk. What was the risk? Recall the missing person report and what Officer James S. Brown, badge number 1658, had written. He had been heading down Roberts Mill Road to where three all-terrain vehicles had been found. He reported, When I arrived on Roberts Mill Road, there were several people there. I could see two of the three-wheelers from the road. There were about six or seven people down at the three-wheelers. All these men had attempted to climb into the jeep, but most of them had been asked to get out because the jeep could not handle the load. Castile didn't know these people who were piling into the back of his jeep. According to Brown's report, they had been climbing and trampling through a crime scene, and someone rummaging around two blood-covered ATVs had taken a raincoat and a bag from the scene. The report was that these had been taken back to the Mason home. So blood, hair, and other evidence could have been transferred into the jeep unbeknownst to Castile. He was only trying to help someone in need. Margaret Bash's testimony indicated that contamination had not occurred. Bash made an interesting observation during Davis's direct examination. She stated, In my experience, officers will send in to me anything they find that has red or reddish-brown stain on it, too, for me to check to see if they've found something with human blood on it. The first thought that came to my mind had been the blood-covered board found and recovered with the ATVs, but we will come back to this later. The next person on the stand was John Lines, who claimed that on July 10th, 1988, he had been at a car wash on Taft Highway, the main thoroughfare across the mountain. He alleged that he had observed a woman washing blood out of the back of a vehicle. A jury-out hearing was had, and he was examined and cross-examined. Mr. Poole, after his questioning, had become irritated at the blatant lies being told. Knowing the judge was going to do just that, he exclaimed, Put him on, Your Honor. The jury filed back into the courtroom. On the stand, Lines said that when he had seen the vehicle, he had written the tag number down. Bill Cox asked, Did you again, after any time after the 10th of July, have the occasion to see this particular vehicle? Lines answered, Yes, I did. And when and where was that? Remember this answer given by John Oliver Lines, Jr., under oath, Monday evening at the command post where we were conducting the search from. He asked some people at the command post to identify the man driving that vehicle. 
he stated they had told him it was Frank Castile. A decade later, on March 23, 1998, John Lines had a joint meeting with the DA and the defense attorneys. While talking to them, he identified the vehicle he saw that day as a pickup truck. He said nothing at all about a Jeep. He was also shown pictures of Mr. and Mrs. Castile and a picture of the Jeep Scrambler. At trial, Mr. Poole questioned Lines on specifics of the vehicle that he only now claimed he had seen that day. Where was the license number on that vehicle you saw? At this point, I can't tell you. If you look up here at this picture now that you've picked out as the vehicle, where was the license number? It was on the back end of the vehicle. Where on the back end? I do not know where it was mounted on the back. Castile did not mount the license plate onto the back of the Jeep in 1988. He always displayed it from inside the back window. This is proven by police photos taken while the Jeep was in their custody. Poole continued, What color was the vehicle you saw on Sunday? At that time it was very muddy and dirty. Very muddy. That's the color of it? But could you tell somewhere underneath that mud and dirt what color it was? I couldn't tell that really till Monday when I saw it again. Mr. Lines testified that approximately between 11 a.m. and 12 p.m., he had seen this Jeep he now identified in court. But just months earlier, before the DA had shown photos to him, he could not identify the Jeep. Let's go back to Janice Hall's testimony for a moment. She testified that around 6 in the morning, she had awoken and walked by a window from which she had seen Castile's Jeep passing by heading towards Roberts Mill Road. D.A. Bill Cox questioned her about this Jeep. Do you think you could identify the Jeep if you saw it again? Yes, I could. Take a look at the monitor if you would, please. Uh, the color looks a little different. It was a little greener looking than I remember. How is it that between 6.30 and 7 o'clock in the morning, from a reasonable distance away, Mrs. Hall was able to identify the color of the Jeep positively and to see a woman driver, lounge chairs, and a collie dog in the back? But yet on that same day, about noon, between 11 and 12, Lines, who was close to this vehicle, could not tell the color of the Jeep because it was so muddy. He claimed a lot of blood in the back was being washed. According to the state's tale, there would have been a lot of blood that morning for the dog to step in. Blood would have been seeping out from the tailgate. Blood would have been drained all along the trail and on Castile's driveway. After climbing the steep incline that is Roberts Mill Road, how would there be so much blood for this man to see? It is probable that wanting his moment of fame, he contacted the DA or the DA wannabe after Castile's arrest and proceeded to alter his story according to the prosecution's failings. Mr. Poole questioned him about what he had told them in this meeting a few months before. Mr. Poole asked about the vehicle he claimed to have seen at the command post and its driver. Now besides not telling Mr. Cox or Mr. Lawrence or myself that it was a Jeep, did you not also say, sir, that you couldn't identify the person driving it? Lyons replied, I said folks at the scene identified the person to me. Did you tell us that you couldn't identify him? Yes, sir. He had told them at the meeting that he could not even identify Castile in a picture that he had been shown. He couldn't identify anything or anyone. Don Poole continued nailing this guy to the wall. Here is a bit more of this cross-examination. In fact, you kept it a secret from Mr. Cox, the state, and from Mr. Lawrence and me on March 23rd, didn't you? No, sir. You didn't keep it a secret. At that point in time, sir, I could not positively say that was the vehicle. So now in mid-May 1998, you're more sure of what it was two months ago or three months ago or ten years ago? Yes, sir. You are? Yes. Amazing, Mr. Lyons. Mr. Poole continued punching this guy. I wish he had gone after all the liars with the same zeal he employed with Mr. Lines. No prior statement or report by this man exists. Nothing had been provided in discovery. In fact, a defense query to the former Chief Deputy Jim Hammond stated he had no memory of Lines or his alleged communication. Apparently, Lines was part of the vigilante group who stepped in to effect a conviction and altered his story several times to conform with the prosecution's theory. Wayne Cox was the next to take the stand. He had been living on Sibley Trail in July of 1988. Mr. Cox was one of the men who came down to the Blue Hole on Sunday, July 10, 1988, while Castile's daughter and her friend were swimming. He was one of the many people searching for the three men in 1988. 
According to his testimony, he and Richard Mason had been good friends. Bill Cox asked him who had been with him that day helping in the search. He named Stanley Nixon, James Walling, and Mark Sively. The DA asked, Dave Ellis? Wayne Cox replied, I met up with Dave Ellis later on in the day before I was going out to where the crime occurred. Of course, he knew nothing on that Sunday, but they were searching intently. He stated that on Sunday evening, he and Dave Ellis had decided to ride out to the Blue Hole and look for any signs, like a manicured area, a knife, coins, and tracks. They rode slowly and carefully, looking for tracks, and they passed through the gate area with nothing catching their attention. The two continued down the trail until they came to the power line clearing. Castile's jeep was parked there, so the two left their ATVs to walk down to the Blue Hole. Along the way, they called out for Castile. Reaching the creek, Mr. Cox introduced Mr. Ellis to Castile, and they asked if he had seen anyone or heard anything. Castile said he had not. As they chatted, he mentioned the dog getting sick and taking it home early that morning. D.A. Bill Cox continued to question Wayne Cox. All right, what was the... What was the demeanor down there at the Blue Hole Sunday afternoon? He seemed tired. All right. Did he... How'd he treat you? He was real friendly. He continued this line of suggestive questions. He asked if he had to sign the logbook and if he had been told to get out. Wayne Cox did not elaborate on his opinion that Castile seemed tired. But the DA later cited that appearing tired at the end of the day was proof of the extreme labor required by his theory... Castile camped the night before, and with his wife, celebrated their anniversary. He had gotten up early, done some hiking, then unloaded and put away the camping gear, but had not been too tired to take his daughter and her friends swimming, or to hike once again, down into and back up that deep gorge. It was late evening, so maybe he was tired, but it was certainly nothing out of the ordinary. He had not been too tired to help the men on the mountainside, and even Lee Griffith, the biased brother, didn't make that claim. Reporting to work early the next day, he contributed a productive day and afterward met with detectives as they had requested. Neither his boss nor the detectives, during their very long interrogation, remarked on symptoms of fatigue. This business about being tired was a concession to the state's fable. It was not at all unusual for Castile to be friendly with everyone. He had been friendly with Mr. Cox from the first time he met him on Leighton Lane. Mr. Cox had been at his mailbox and given him directions to the property. On another occasion, Mr. Cox with Gary Sibley and his wife visited the property. They had demonstrated their shortcut to the area. These neighbors and others would occasionally visit and were welcomed. Mr. Ellis lived on Leighton Lane and Castile had visited his home with Carter Patton's realtor. Numerous people had told Roy Parham and his assistant that Castile had been nice to them while they were on the property. For the most part, their interviews had been short. If they had nothing harsh to contribute, the detectives lost interest. Some of these were mentioned in Chapter 2. Prosecutors characterized informing people of private property or denying them access as an illegal act, ignoring and misrepresenting Tennessee law regarding private property, by their insinuations or direct statements to the jury, was a blatant and purposed lie. The log had been recommended by Lieutenant Brown of the Hamilton County Sheriff's Department. Its purpose was to help slow trespassing by creating a record so that repeat offenders could be recognized and admonished by a legal letter before calling for police action. Castile had accepted this advice and thought this would be a reasonable approach to the problem. This was the same method employed by Cecil Hickman, caretaker for Patton's land. It is thought-provoking to consider the prosecution's vehement attack on a process recommended by the Hamilton County Sheriff's Department. Bill Cox called Pam O'Neill to the stand. She and her husband owned a large tract of land at the end of Walker Road. This traditionally was called Jake's Campground. She explained that she, her husband, and her kids had spent the whole day on the property July 9, 1988. They had planned to stay the night in a cabin that was located on the property. She said, And so it was dinner time, and I cut the generator off and went over there to see where he was, and the dog started barking, and I could hear four-wheelers come across the property go down towards the creek, and it wasn't too long after that that I heard shots. In later testimony, 
She was asked how much time passed between hearing the ATVs and hearing the shots. Ten minutes, she explained. I don't know, ten, fifteen minutes, I don't remember. Recall Stanley Nixon, the state's expert tracker. He testified he had tracked the three men across the creek. Tracking them up the other side into Sequatchie County, he looped around to come out on Vandergriff Road. At this point, he lost the tracks. But he did not even attempt to scout the trail that led to the Blue Hole, where, according to the state a decade later, the three had been heading. This trip would have required much more time than allowed by Mrs. Neal's ten to fifteen minutes. She went on to say that about two in the morning, they decided to leave and go home because the bugs had gotten bad. They drove up to Walker Road to where a driver must turn onto Corral Road. The Mason home was located on this corner. She stated they had stopped and saw a car coming down Corral Road. She said the headlights told her it was a Jeep and it was going towards Sawyer Road. Then on cross-examination, she was asked about her police interview description of the vehicle they had seen that night. In that statement, she had said it looked like an old Willie's Jeep. Tom and Pam O'Neill's interview had taken place on September 5, 1988. Charles Hawkins had conducted the query. Hawkins said, Pam, in your own words and your best recollection, tell us what you recall about this vehicle. Mrs. O'Neill described what they had done that night. In regard to the vehicle, I mean, it was about halfway, and I can remember our lights on our car shining on the back right tire. And I remember the car was kind of dark, and I remember thinking to myself that it looked like an old Willie's Jeep that a friend of ours had. And over the tire of this car, there were these kind of indentions. It wasn't just a straight car. The Jeep Scrambler does not have indentions over the tires, as she described. Also, if she saw the back right tire of this car, her word, it could not have been heading towards Sawyer Road. Then Hawkins asked, But you definitely recall, as you stated to me back a month ago, that the memory then and now is the old Willie's Jeep-type body that you seen on the vehicle? She answered, Yes. Then Hawkins did what they always did. Even though Castile's name or Jeep had never been mentioned by the O'Neills, Hawkins asked, Have you ever seen Frank Castile's scrambler? He not only introduced Castile's name to them, but he also gave them the type of Jeep he owned. She responded that she had never seen his Jeep. Then the detective went on to show them pictures of Castile's Jeep. Neither Castile's Jeep nor his name had been mentioned until the detective brought them up. The car, her word, that she had seen that night was never positively identified, but in this manner the detectives poisoned all meaningful recollections of potential witnesses. Hawkins, along with Param and Sneed, had exercised this routine. In short order, the detectives had made Castile persona non grata with the entire community. Next, the state called Tom Clark, a man who had been convicted of selling and or delivering hard drugs in the early 90s. Tom Clark, Donnie Jones, and their wives intruded into private property on May 25, 1988. But Mr. Clark and Mr. Jones both, under oath, testified that they had trespassed during the 4th of July weekend, the wrong date. Recall what Mr. Clark had told Sneed in the group interview that took place on November 17, 1988. Sneed had shown him a picture and identified Frank Castile for him. On the stand, he again gave the wrong date on which he and his friends had trespassed. On cross-examination, he said he would not be able to identify Frank Castile. The fact that he could not identify Castile as the person and that he had given the wrong date suggests that he probably had a run-in with someone else. Donnie Jones testified with all certainty that it had been the July 4th weekend when they trespassed. Even after being confronted with the logbook showing May of 1988, he firmly stated that it had been the 4th of July weekend. Recall that the logbook was in chronological order, so Jones would have been stating this despite seeing entries following his own at later dates. Mark Sibley was another person with a bad background of deceit and lies. The courts had labeled him a habitual criminal. He owned property that adjoined Castile's right-of-way. Even though he had testified the day before, the state called him back to enhance their tale. He alleged a last-minute memory of an encounter with Frank Castile that he had not mentioned the day before. His story was that he had ridden out to the gate area where he ran into Castile and they had a conversation. Alluding to the shotgun, Sibley claimed that Castile had told him 
As long as I've got this, I won't have any trouble. Mr. Cox made a claim. A week before the murders, Castile had posted himself at the gate. That's where he was? Mr. Sibley answered, Yes, sir. Castile denied Sibley's lie, but an alleged chance meeting was not evidence of him posting himself at the gate. This was yet another accusation the state had made without proof. If Castile had posted himself at the gate, then why had Terry Mills and Jeff Mann not been stopped and turned around at the gate? On cross-examination, Sibley said the conversation they had was a nice one. He admitted there had been no confrontation or threats. He said that he had told the detectives about this conversation. Ironically, the defense had not been supplied with any statement or report given by this man. This appeared to be a planned maneuver to prevent a ready defense rebuttal. The state had withheld many statements from discovery, but this had marks of a concerted effort. Jonathan Uton was called next. He said he and Michael Dantzler had been out riding. Uton was on a motorbike, and Mr. Dantzler was driving a jeep. When he came into the power line clearing, he passed his friend's jeep. Mr. Cox asked, Is this pretty noisy? Is it a trail bike? Uton replied, It's extremely loud. He alleged that he had seen a man stepping out of the woods who pulled a gun and pointed it at him. He took off back into the woods and stopped until he heard someone coming. He took off again. He took a left turn out of the woods onto Vandergriff Road going towards Sawyer Road. Again, he stopped, but then he claimed that Castile had come up behind him. Mr. Uton described a chase that had reached 70 miles per hour. After a couple of miles, he lost Castile. He said that later, Mr. Dantzler told him that this man had fired a gunshot over his head. This sounds eerily similar to Stanley Nixon's and Richard Mason's run-in with Cecil Hickman. Mr. Dantzler was called to testify. He told his tale. He claimed to be around 120 feet away when he saw Castile shoot over Uton's head. His account included the extremely loud motorcycle racing away, as Uton described, but possibly it had been a backfire from a stressed engine with a damaged muffler that may have sounded like a gunshot that Mr. Ewan had not observed. He claimed to have stopped after Mr. Uton had taken off and left him behind. He alleged that Castile told him that he was going to start shooting people. Don Poole, during his cross-examination, asked, And then did he follow you or lead you or what? Mr. Dantzler replied, I believe he followed me. I'm not a hundred percent. This has been a long time ago, sir. Mr. Uton had claimed to have been on Vandergriff Road when Castile came up behind him, and the Dukes of Hazard chase began. He said he had not seen Mr. Dantzler again after he had taken off. Vandergriff has a distinct twist as it nears Sawyer Road. This chase was a fabricated tale, and Dantzler had attempted to support his friend's story. He had to invent this claim that Castile had passed him to support this fairy tale chase. A decade earlier, while talking with Parham and Sneed in August of 1988, Parham asked him, Okay, now you were right there at the camp, weren't you? Uh, what do you mean by the camp? Where he... Well, did you see where he has a fireplace? No, sir. Oh, you didn't see any of that? Yeah, I was on the power line. You know where the dip in the power line is? Yeah, okay, in the dip. And, um, I... Well, he followed me back out in a scrambler, a green scrambler. All right, he got out there then. Now, is that where the jeep was? No, sir. I didn't even see the scrambler. All right, but after you let him out there, then he got in his jeep scrambler? Yes, sir. And he followed you out? Yes, sir, because my engine died. My battery was dead, or the alternator wasn't charging, and he pulled me till I got started, and he just, well, he made sure that I made it all the way out. There was no mention of Castile passing him as he followed Mr. Dantzler. Neither man had gone to the police immediately after leaving. If some stranger had pointed a gun at you and said that he was going to start shooting people, a rational response would have been to report this to the police immediately. At this late date, and prodded by demonstrated police coercion, threats had been alleged, even though no one had sought to file charges against Castile. Detective Sneed was called back to the stand. Dollar Davis asked about a blue substance and a grommet that Sneed alleged to have found in a fire pit. Davis and Sneed were advancing that this had been part of a tarp. Sneed alleged that Roy Parham, the lead detective, and he had collected this from the fire pit on July 11, 1988. 
According to a TBI lab report, on July 18, 1988, the Nashville TBI Crime Lab received from James A. Baker the following. Number 12. One large rock. Number 13. Debris identified as recovered from campfire. The results of testing are as follows. Unknown substance. Comparison of blue substance from Exhibit 12, rock, to blue substance in Exhibit 13, debris, revealed them to be consistent with respect to color, texture, and organic composition. Because of lack of sample in Exhibit 12 and Exhibit 13, no further comparisons were possible. If this mass of blue material and grommet had existed as Sneed claimed, it would have been listed and sent with the rock and debris. There certainly would not have been a lack of sample as claimed in the report. There exists evidence of when and how this mass came into existence, and I will present that later. There was no mention of any grommet in the lab report. There had not been any indication from where this rock came, plus the lab could not identify the substance. Sneed indicated this grommet and blue substance had been tested twice. Both tests were inconclusive, according to Sneed. He was asked by defense attorney Don Poole, Let me ask you that, because some of that you're talking about, we didn't have complete records of it. Do you have something in your files to indicate that, you know, I, Detective Sneed or Detective Parham, on this date did these things? Do you have your notes or files or anything to reveal that, sir? Sneed admitted, I don't. I have no notes with me, no. Are there notes? If he had collected anything, then it would have been his responsibility to issue a report. Sneed dodged the question. There would be probably a report. I think Detective Jim Baker made the report at the time. Later in the trial, Sneed was questioned further about this blue substance. This took place outside the presence of the jury. Poole questioned him about the interview of George Eddie Brown, which contradicts Sneed's claim that this blue substance had been collected on Monday, July 11, 1988. Poole, reading from Eddie Brown's statement taken August of 1988, noted, Goodman, now Friday, the following Friday, I forget the exact date, it will be on the 15th, July 15th, I believe, you contacted Lieutenant Hawkins, and then eventually talked to me, Lieutenant Goodman, about when you had taken some TV personnel up to the campsite area up on Mr. Castile's property. Relate to me what you found when you took the TV people up there that we apparently hadn't found or the searchers hadn't picked up. Sneed still claimed that he had collected the blue substance on Monday, July 11, 1988, even after he had been confronted with evidence to the contrary. Mr. Poole asked, Do you have anything at all to indicate in writing? This is what followed. In writing? Yes, sir. Probably not. It was the same day that the crime scene was found at the gate. One last thing, sir. Were there any rules at all about how you brought it into the vault and kept up with it in any way, sir? The vault was maintained only by myself and Detective Parham, and it was in the Major Crimes Office. So you had no rules about logging it in when you got it or anything. You just kind of tossed everything you found, you dumped into the vault, and at some point took it out. Anything that wasn't going to the laboratory was turned in at the regular property room. Sneed continued to not answer the question about rules. Any good law enforcement agency has a chain of custody for evidence collected. It is clear they did not keep any chain of custody logs. Poole said, We're talking about something that happened ten years ago, and you sit here in front of the court right now. You're saying, Judge Meyer, I can swear to you that on this day, the 11th, that I seized those items from the fire pit. That is correct. And all you're relying on is, I take it, memory? That is correct. His memory was not an acceptable chain of custody. Throughout this case, Sneed brought up things from memory. He was asked if notes or reports existed on this or that, but nothing was ever produced. Unfortunately, the attorneys never pushed the issue. The state and Detective Sneed were allowed to make claims to the jury, but they were never made to produce any proof. If this had been collected on July 11, 1988, why was there no report? And if this had been important to them, why did they not collect the blue tarp that was sitting on a metal shelf in the basement of the Castile home? With the jury absent, Don Poole continued to question him about how and when he allegedly had obtained this substance. Sneed said, We were looking for anything at that time, anything that might lead us to the three men, anything that didn't look exactly in place or anything. 
a purse and shoes had been found less than a mile from the gate area during the search, according to a news article published on Sunday, July 17, 1988. These things were out of place, and David Clemens had been allowed to take the purse home, where he claimed to have thrown it in the garage and forgotten about it. The detectives had also neglected other unusual items, such as shoes. Every time the defense would object to a witness, Judge Meyer would generally deny it. Everything the state wanted, the state got, practically all of the time. This included Marie Hill. You remember Donna Taylor and Jerry Anderson. The judge would not allow the defense to ask about their affair, but three hours of a taped argument among Frank Castile, Linda Castile, and Marie Hill was admissible. In a jury out hearing, Poole said, Your Honor, the fact that these three people get into an argument that goes on for three hours, there is nothing in the law that would allow this to come in. So we object on the basis that it's not authenticated at this time. We object on the basis that part of it is unintelligible. We object on the basis that it is blatant hearsay. We object on the basis that the purpose of it is to come in against Castile, to treat him as a bad person, to say he should have done something in an argument with his girlfriend and wife, and I don't know that he should. In the United States, everyone has a right to speak or remain silent. Mr. Lawrence said, If I could simply add, too, the prejudice of these tapes certainly outweighs the probative value that it has. But, of course, this was all admissible, according to the judge. So the jury and everyone in the courtroom sat through three hours of arguing about a myriad of different things. The prosecution had wanted to take just certain portions of the argument, but out of context it would be easy for them to build on their mendacities. The state alleged that these confused and unclear three hours contained an adoptive admission. If someone said that you went to Mars, and you, in turn, did not contradict or deny that you went to Mars, then in a court of law, you must have gone to Mars. According to uslegal.com, to constitute an adoptive admission, the following conditions must be satisfied. 1. That statement was made to the defendant or made in his or her presence. These were tape recordings. You cannot see his presence or what Mr. Castile was doing at the time, like mannerisms, facial expressions, etc. Number 2. That the defendant heard and understood the statement. There was just no way to prove what Castile heard or understood in the context of communication. Number three, that the defendant would, under all the circumstances, naturally have denied the statement if he or she thought it was not true. Marie Hill knew Castile denied doing this crime. Remember that she said, he denies it to this day. He would have accepted that both women were aware of his denial. Number four, that the defendant could have denied it but did not. Only the prosecution claimed that the context related to the killings. There was just no rationale to indicate that any accusations had not been denied. In the Cardozo Law Review, in a paper titled Adoptive Admissions and the Duty to Speak, the author, Brett Rubert, discusses, Skepticism about the probative value of silence appears in some of the earliest cases in which it is discussed. The Supreme Court of Pennsylvania in the 1826 case Moore v. Smith, referred to adoptive admissions by silence as the most dangerous type of evidence and cautioned that they should only be used in limited circumstances. Most recently, courts and scholars pointed to a number of assumptions implicit in the adoptive admission rule that are problematic. These criticisms fall roughly into three categories. One, that people remain silent in the face of an accusation for many reasons, and that, therefore, such silence is of little probative value. Number two, that the adoptive admission rule creates a duty to speak in the face of an accusation that is unrealistic, unenforceable, and unfair. And three, that the admissibility of silence in the face of an accusation in an informal setting is incongruent with the constitutional right to remain silent when accused in court. Consider in this case what the state alleged to be an adoptive admission. Early in the argument, Linda explained, I'm tired of hurting. I've stood by you for 30 years. I had myself drugged down to the police station and fingerprinted because of what you'd done. I've been through hell these last two months with people bothering me at work. I don't. I, she said it wasn't her, and I'm going to believe that, and people bothering me at home. The statement, had myself drugged down to the police station and fingerprinted because of what you'd done, 
is what the state claimed to be an adoptive admission. That statement alone is out of context. Later, Linda explained, this way you've given them a leverage. You have given them something to work with, and they're playing it for all they can, and they're probably laughing and enjoying this so much. Linda's observation, born of months of continuous harassment, would prove to be prophetic. Hill asked, who is they? She was playing her part. She was proving to be a very deceitful person. A harassment campaign was being led by officials and vigilantes who wanted Castile framed for this crime. Remember how Paula had passed the gossip along to Sneed, and how she told him that it would be a good thing if Mr. and Mrs. Castile were to split up, possibly setting in motion the idea. After more arguing, Linda had said, Frankie, you could not find anybody in this world to love you more than I do. If I didn't say it every day, the things I did for you, things I have done for you through the years, that doesn't mean anything? That doesn't prove to you that I love you? Anyone could see that Linda was hurting, but the statement she made does not present the clear accusation the state claimed. Yes, she did a lot of things for Frank, like taking care of him through his back injury, giving him three kids, helping him through school, and giving up her inheritance so he could buy the land. And yes, she had stood by him as the media, gossip, detectives, and cowardly vigilantes sent threatening letters and made threatening phone calls over the years. Linda had never been dragged down to any police station to be fingerprinted. She had freely allowed herself to be fingerprinted in 1988, but she was dragged down to the hospital by Gaskill and his thugs. D.A. Cox and Lee Davis claimed that Linda's comments formed an adoptive admission by Frank Castile, but they ignored a clear rebuttal on this same tape. Agent Hill said, You told me about the deal in Saudi. You told me you own property on the mountain where somebody got killed. Frank replied, I've never known where somebody got killed. I did, in fact, own property on the mountain. They want me to be guilty. I guess in fighting two women from two directions, both against me and each other, would probably lend a hand in them making me a guilty person. That statement is a crystal clear denial by Castile. After listening to three hours of arguing, much of which was not discernible and all of which was unseen, Hill was questioned by defense attorney Phil Lawrence. He asked her a series of questions that I think are quite telling about Hill. Mr. Lawrence asked, So you didn't love him. You continued to have a physical relationship with him, and the reason you wanted to is because of your association with the police and your endeavor to be a spy or whatever to get this information? I guess, yes, sir. Did you have some profit motive? No. Just a good citizen. Yes, sir. Mr. Lawrence continued his cross-examination. He asked her if she thought this whole thing was a lark. This is what followed. No, sir. You didn't find some humor in all that? No, sir. It was a tedious ordeal. Then Mr. Lawrence wanted to play another tape for the jury. It would show just how much she did think this was a lark. Of course, the state didn't want it played, and they strenuously objected. They approached the bench, and this is what proceeded. Mr. Cox said, You haven't offered us anything. Mr. Lawrence replied, I'm going to play a tape that you made, you gave me. Well, you want to tell us what you're playing? What tape? Is that the same tape we just played? Mr. Cox was very agitated, and with a raised voice demanded a jury out hearing. After the bench conference had ended, the judge sent the jury out of the room. Then Mr. Lawrence told the judge that he wanted Marie Hill out of the room also. The tape was played for the judge and the state. The court asked the state if they wanted to be heard. Mr. Cox said, Do you have a date of that recording? Mr. Lawrence replied, I got this from you, Mr. Cox. I don't know. It's your investigation, not mine. Before the contents of the tape had been revealed to Mr. Cox, he stated, We don't think it's relevant to anything, Your Honor. It's hearsay. It doesn't have anything to do with this defendant. The tapes are now hearsay to Mr. Cox, and it was clearly about the defendant. For once, the judge agreed with the defense and allowed the tape to be played in front of the jury. Transcript of tape in part. Hey, hey, I've got boxes of clothes all over my front porch. Yeah, I heard that. Can Martha and I spread them all over the front yard or have a sale or should we have a garage sale? How many boxes did she leave you? And you hear Hill rummaging the contents and telling them what she found. 
just having a blast, laughing and giggling with obvious glee, like a kid on Christmas morning announcing what she got. The tape continued. Did we stir up some shit? What's that? Later in this joyous conversation. So I guess we better not throw them all over the yard. No, that probably wouldn't be a good thing to do. I'll be nice then. I'm just going to leave him out there. He ain't moving in here. You've got to have a little bit of compassion. After the tape was played, Mr. Lawrence asked Hill, What was the joke? Was the joke the fact that this woman whose heart was broken brought her husband's clothes up there and you put them on the front porch? Is that what you thought was funny, Ms. Hill? She replied, I just found, I, I don't know, that it had worked, what they wanted to do. Mr. Lawrence asked, I'm sorry, you didn't have any compassion, did you? Even the police officer said you ought to have a little compassion. She stated that the first time she had her suspicion about Castile was after she got a phone call and then received something in the mail. She was asked, Is that when those wheels started turning and you decided to use your body to try to get information for your own advantage? This was not the only time she was recorded on the phone, laughing it up with her cohorts because of the trouble they were causing Mr. and Mrs. Castile. Then she was asked how many men she had been dating at the time. Sidestepping the question, she said she was hoping to get back with another man after this was over. She had deceptively left out her continuous relationship with Larry Parker. Phil inquired, had him sort of waiting. He was on the shelf just waiting for you to do whatever you had to do with Mr. Castillo, and then you were going to go back with him, right? Yes. She discussed this side relationship during one of the many hours of recorded calls. Well, I'm going to get out for a while. What I thought I would do is, I'm going over at Larry's. If I don't spend some time with him, he's going to show up over here. He passed us yesterday when we were walking. Do you want to drive by? Martha added. Right. So anyway, it's been quiet. I think I'll hear from Castile sometime today. You know, it doesn't hurt if I'm not here every time he calls or shows up either. You mean Frank? Yeah. So I'm going to go over there and see if Larry will help me clean up my car and get me something to eat and go to an early movie and then come back home. Because like I said, if I don't spend, for one thing, I want a life after this. After the state had played this three-hour argument between Mr. and Mrs. Castile and Ms. Hill, Don Poole addressed the court. May it please the court, this evidence is irrelevant, it's immaterial, it's highly prejudicial, serves no probative value whatsoever. Now, the jury now thinks, well, we're dealing with, I guess, a, a bad guy, a guy who has an affair. Maybe there's no evidence of murder. Maybe there was nothing on those three hours of tape to indicate any admission at all, but he probably did it. And may it please the court, based on that, we would move for a mistrial. And I think there is no way, after listening to these tapes, that Frank Castile can receive a fair trial. In turn, Judge Meyer denied the motion for mistrial. Then he proceeded to point out parts of the tapes that he thought were tacit admissions. Let me interject something I think must be said before going further. In no way am I defending my dad's decision to have an affair. He made a big mistake seeing this cold-hearted and scheming woman. She proved herself to be a very deceitful person. Her deceptive actions were brought out in court. But I know, as the saying goes, it takes two to tango. I did not stop loving my father because of his bad decision, as he never stopped loving me for the mistakes I have made. The Bible tells how Delilah tempted and deceived Samson. In the end, God forgave him for his sin. Next, the state called Steve Craig to the stand. He stated that he had a conversation with Castile on the trail leading to the Blue Hole. He alleged Castile had a crazed look in his eye. He claimed Castile had said, them GD sons of bitches driving them four-wheelers? I'll shoot one of them if I have to. Mr. Craig was there on May 1, 1988. He had been to the property before and had been told if he would call ahead, he could come back. He had been offered access to the blue hole if he would pick up some garbage. In the cross-examination, this is what occurred. Mr. Poole asked, Okay, and you read the paper and listened to TV and radio, and you knew about that, didn't you? Steve Craig replied, Yeah, I knew about the three men. Okay. And I guess knowing what you did about that, and knowing that you talked to Mr. Castile, you called the police up pretty quickly and told them what had happened to you? I never contacted the police. A decade later, Mr. Craig attributed this disturbing statement to Castile, 
but he had never called the police. Adequate contact information was noted in the log, but the detectives never talked with him. So he held on to this information for all those years. No, he was merely trying to get his ten minutes of fame. He didn't call because it had not happened. Everyone who knew Castile recognized that this was not his language. Further, it was ridiculous to think that someone would not have passed this on to the proper authorities immediately. The jury was taken over to the police service center. Originally, this building had been built as a Kmart shopping store. The jeep had been hauled over to the police service center. Castile had given the okay to have this done. Two big red ATVs were also brought over to the same facility for jury inspection. A juror asked if the bed of the jeep had ever been oak. The answer was no, it was a standard CJ-8, and the bed had always been metal. Jurors did not avail themselves of a tape measure lying on the tailgate to measure its width. 